The regulation of metabolic pathways can seem really, really complicated, but it boils down to some common themes that we're going to see come up over and over again in all sorts of different pathways. Because remember, all of these pathways are kind of like interconnected. They're not really pathways. It's more like this giant web, like an interconnected subway system. And just how you want to tightly regulate that subway system so you don't have trains colliding and futile cycles and um, too many trains on one track and not enough trains on the other track. Similarly, we want to be able to control metabolism in order to have our supply meet our demand and not exceed our demand. We need to be able to respond to external signals. We need to be able to do all sorts of different things. And the same sorts of metabolic tricks can be used to regulate all sorts of different pathways. And so we're going to talk about some of these sort of metabolic tricks, this metabolic logic of regulation. As an example, we're going to look at those pathways that we looked at the other day, glycolysis, the breakdown of glucose to form pyruvate, and gluconeogenesis, the building of glucose from pyruvate. We're going to talk about how these are kind of going to be reciprocally regulated, because basically you don't want to have a futile cycle where you're basically breaking down glucose at the same time as you're making it, especially because you're kind of going to want to make glucose or break down glucose at different times. You might want to do glycolysis when, well, there's a lot of glucose, but you don't have enough energy. And if you're the liver, you might want to do glucogenesis when you have plenty of energy, but not much glucose. So you need to make some glucose to send out to other cells. This is an example of kind of compartmentalization. I mentioned the liver because that's where this gluconeogenesis is actually going to take place. And one of the ways that we can regulate metabolic pathways is by compartmentalization and specialization. We can specialize so that only certain cells or certain tissue types are able to actually carry out various processes because only they will have the enzymes responsible to basically carry out some of the reactions required. Additionally, even if some tissues have those enzymes, we can have different versions of the enzymes in different tissues that are then able to be regulated separately and have different kinetic properties. So we'll take a look at this in our example. So in our example of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, we'll also see other concepts. We're going to see how we're basically going to want to regulate the far from equilibrium steps because these are going to be the ones that are hard to go back from. Remember when we say far from equilibrium, basically what we're saying is that we have a really, really large negative delta G. We're far from equilibrium. There's a strong drive to go towards equilibrium. And basically it's going to go be really, really hard to go in the reverse. These are typically going to be um, the sort of committed steps for a pathway, as well as entry steps into a pathway. We'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by committed but basically, when you have glucose into a cell, you can kind of, it can go a variety of different ways. We're going to talk mostly about glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, but there's also, I will mention something called the pentose phosphate pathway, which is an alternative fate for glucose, as well as we can do things like um, make glycogen. So piece together those glucoses for storage. But basically, that first step of glycolysis, the trapping of the glucose through phosphorylation, that's actually not a committed step because this, this change into this pentose phosphate pathway actually requires that same first step as well. And instead, it's the second step, this, um, this step from fructose, or the third step, the step from fructose 6 phosphate to fructose 1 6 bisphosphate in glycolysis that's actually going to be our committed step to glycolysis because after here basically you go down to you go down the glycolytic pathway rather than going to the pentose phosphate pathway consequently this is going to be a very very highly regulated step and we're going to see some key principles of metabolic regulation take place in this step by controlling the enzymes in the forward and the reverse pathway so this is an example of one of those committed steps, as well as one of those far from equilibrium steps, in which we basically have to use different enzymes to go in the different directions. As you might imagine, if you're far from equilibrium and it's hard to go backwards, well, you're not going to be able to go backwards just by changing the concentrations a little bit. Instead, you're going to want to regulate the enzymes.
And rather than using the same enzyme, we'll have two different enzymes, one that will catalyze the direction in the reaction in one direction and one that'll catalyze the reaction in the reverse direction. Although that all the enzymatic reactions are theoretically reversible, basically we're gonna wanna go a different pathway if it's gonna be really, really hard to go in reverse with the one. And so that's why we're going to see different enzymes used that'll do things like instead of trying to transfer a phosphate back from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate onto ADP, they'll just chop that, AT that phosphate off with water. So we'll see hydrolysis instead of a sort of kinase reaction in the reverse. Now, how do we regulate these different enzymes? We can regulate them with the same things, but in opposite ways. And what do we want to regulate them with? Well, we're gonna want to regulate them with basically signals of the supply and of the demand. This is often going to be done through allosteric regulation. So when we're using these small molecules that are actually intermediates of the pathway often, in order to change the, to bind to and change the shape of the enzymes. We'll see examples of both negative modulation and positive modulation. When it comes to negative modulation, basically you're decreasing the activity of the enzyme, and this is often done in response to the buildup of products. So if you have a pathway and you're building up products down the line, basically your demand, you can you have your supply outpacing your demand. You don't want to keep making products if you're not going to be using them. And so then you'd want to have those products feed backwards in order to um, decrease the supply and, and change things to an alternative pathway. So instead of just kind of like stopping things, what you could do is you could actually have that same product of one reaction stimulate the activation of the opposite reaction or of the reaction that takes things in a different pathway. Alternatively, you can have positive modulation, or I guess this could be positive modulation like we were just talking about, but for the other pathway. Positive modulation from the same pathway could be things like having upstream intermediates provide feedback, feed forward. So for, for this would basically be your, um, your reactants signaling your signaling the enzyme that, hey, there's a lot of stuff up here, keep going forward. And so we're gonna see examples where we'll have things farther up in the pathway be actually feeding um, forward and saying, hey, get ready for us. There's a lot of stuff coming down the line. We can also integrate signals from alternative pathways. So maybe we don't, we haven't done a lot of glycolysis, but we still have a lot of energy. And so if we still have a lot of energy, if we still have products like citrate that are coming from fatty acid oxidation, well, then we can basically use that as a signal that we've got plenty of energy as well. We can also use hormones to relay signals of changes in demand and the external needs. Often these changes are going to be passed away on through phosphorylation cascades, and these phosphorylation cascades can alter the activity of enzymes, including enzymes that produce small molecules that act as allosteric regulators, such as we'll see with this instance of F26BP, a modulator of PFK1 and FBPase1 that's actually going to be regulated by insulin and glucagon. In this way, you're able to not only respond to changes within the single cell, but changes within the body and kind of get ready for what's coming. So yes, it can seem really complicated and sometimes it can feel really complicated and metabolism is really, really messy. And this isn't even showing you the regulation, but the regulation is logical, just like all of metabolism is logical. And so let's focus on that that logic as we go and look at specific examples. Let's try to pick out where we see these different logical strategies at play in the examples of the regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So remember, when would we want to do glycolysis? If there's lots of glucose, but not enough energy. And so how do we know if there's not enough energy? It's easy to tell if we have a lot of glucose, but how about energy? Well, basically we would have low concentrations of ATP and high concentrations of ADP and AMP. So remember that AMP was gonna be kind of like a more sensitive indicator of energy levels than ADP um, because we had that bigger, we had that we could take two ADPs and change them into ATP and AMP. Um, and therefore we're going to kind of keep um, 
the AMP level, the ATP to AMP ratio is going to be a better indicator, but we'll see that both ADP and AMP are going to be allosteric regulators. So they're going to be able to bind to enzymes and alter their activity. Another sign of um, not enough energy would be if we had low NAD plus and high NADH. Alternatively, we, if we had enough energy but not much glucose, we would have the opposite conditions and we would want to make glucose through new gluconeogenesis. You could also then like break down glycogen, um, but we're going to not get, we'll talk about that later, but not right now. Right now, let's just focus on this glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. And so, well, what, before we can talk about which direction things are going to go once they're inside the cell, we need, once glucose is inside the cell, we need to talk about how glucose is actually going to get inside the cell. Glucose transporters are going to be regulated through hormonal signaling. In response to insulin, which is basically a signal that's saying like, oh yeah, we just had a big meal or something. We've got a lot of sugar. Um, we want the cells to let sugar in. Well, one of the ways that they can respond and let sugar in is by basically taking these pre-made glucose transporters um, in that we're kind of just like hanging out in these internal membrane um, vesicles and then transport them onto the surface. So in this way, we're able to control the import of glucose into the cells to begin with. And then once they're in the cells, that's where we decide, okay, do we want to trap them? Do we want to have this um, do we want to trap this glucose inside the cells so that we can use it for things? That trapping is done by this hexokinase. Humans actually have four isozymes of hexokinase. So isozyme is basically just a different version of an enzyme. And these different versions of this enzyme are located in different tissues and regulated differently. Hexokinase was one, two, and three. Um, are all pretty similar in that they're inhibited by their end product, glucose 6-phosphate, and they have a low KM. In contrast, this, this isozyme hexokinase 4, or glucokinase, the version that predominates in our liver, it's not inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, and it has different kinetic properties, and these are related to its role as kind of serving as a sensor and regulator of blood sugar, and we will talk about it more in a second. First, let's consider this glucose 6-phosphate feedback inhibition. This is an example of what we were talking about before, of how the product of a, of a reaction can act as a al negative allosteric modulator of the reaction's enzymes. Basically, if you have a lot of glucose 6-phosphate building up and not being tunneled down the pathway, this indicates that you have enough glucose, you don't need to keep trapping glucose 6-phosphate, and so let us let um, let us not trap it and let some other cells have it. However, because it also has this low KM, what this means is that even if there's not that much blood sugar around, these cells will basically be able to take it in, um, and this enzyme will be working maximally. So remember, a KM was our concentration at which the enzyme was like half at maximal velocity. And it was a measure of sort of affinity. So basically, these enzymes that are in our muscles and other tissues, these are going to be very good at basically taking up that glucose and using it. The version, however, in our liver, this glucokinase, it has a higher KM. So it has a weaker affinity for that glucose. What does this mean? Well, it means a couple things. One is that at those physiological levels, at like kind of like the normal blood sugar levels, it's not going to be fully active. And this is important because basically our liver, it has these really efficient glucose transporters. So it's basically gonna be kind of in equilibrium with the blood. blood. So if there's high blood sugar, these cells are going to have a lot of glucose in them. And it's kind of, um, this way the liver can kind of sense what's going on. So if you didn't have very efficient glucose transporters, even if there was a bunch of blood sugar around, your cells wouldn't be taking a bunch of it in. So they won't even know that blood sugar was high, but it's your liver's job to kind of realize, Hey, blood sugar is higher. And then let's, okay, let's take some blood sugar in and let's make glycogen. Let's burn it. Let's do all sorts of stuff. Or blood sugar's low. Let us go break down some glycogen and release that. Let us go and make glucose from gluconeogenesis. 
So your liver needs to be able to recognize what's going on blood sugar wise. And it's actually able to do this by having this hexokinase that has, or this glucokinase that basically it can serve as a glucose sensor because of this high KM. So if we look for any enzyme, basically there will be a point in the beginning of the concentration range at which you get that kind of linear range if you're plotting out your michaelis menten curve, where you have a relationship between your substrate and the velocity. But then things plateau out when you reach saturation. At physiological levels, the hexokinase 1 is going to be at saturation, and so it's not going to respond to, it won't change activity in if you change the blood sugar. However, in the case of our liver, well, here it is going to be able to um, respond linearly to the change in substrate concentration. So as the as glucose blood glucose levels rise, this, le this liver enzyme is going to be able to respond and activate further. Having the high KM is also going to have the effect that the liver isn't going to basically hog all the glucose. So remember, it's got those really efficient transporters. It's going to let a bunch of glucose into the cells. If it were to trap it all, then the rest of the body wouldn't have it enough. But, the but we do want our liver to be able to take in a lot because its job is not just to burn glucose and stuff. It can also store it. So if there's a lot of high blood sugar, what the liver is going to do is it can actually store it as glycogen. So if we don't want to be inhibiting, uh, we don't want to have too much being inhibited by this negative feedback, because if we do have a lot of glucose in the blood, we want the liver to be taking care of it. And so this liver version is not going to be inhibited by the G6P. Additionally, remember we have like gluconeogenesis and stuff going on in the liver. If we are making glucose, we won't want to just be phosphorylating it and letting it back um, and trapping it in the liver cells when we need to release it to the body. And so by um, having the slower activity of the hexokinase, of this glucokinase in the liver, what that's able to do is it's able to keep the liver from trapping what it's making and let the what it's making out. So different reasons why this liver version is going to be especially great for its job. And that's a regulatory example of these isozymes and specialization at play. Our next step that we need to regulate is this big one, that fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, so remember in glycolysis, that's carried out by phosphofructokinase 1. And then to go the reverse way, we're going to use fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase 1. And these are going to be highly regulated and reciprocally regulated. So why are they so crazy highly regulated? Um, because as I mentioned, this was the committed step of glycolysis. So basically, a lot of things we need, can, glucose can go a lot of different directions once you trap it inside of the cells. One of the main other ways it could go other than glycolysis is basically the is called the pentose phosphate pathway. This is going to be used to make um, NADPH, DNA, RNA, fatty acids, steroids, et cetera. So there's all these sorts of other things we can do with glucose rather than just break it down for energy. And so, but either with either of those, we're gonna need to trap the glucose inside of the cells, which is where the hexokinase is gonna come in to play. So if we want to use glucose for any of those things, we're gonna want to phosphorylate it. So that wouldn't be a, the like main commit, that's not a committed step to glycolysis. Instead, after we do this isomerase step, the next step is the, the committed step where we're basically actually saying, okay, now let's take this fructose 6-phosphate and change it to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. In order to kind of regulate what direction things will go, one of the main regulators of this is going to be NADPH. We'll get back to the pentose phosphate um, pathway at the end because that G6PD it turns out to be medically important. And I'll tell you about this, that story at the end. Um, so spoiler alert, stay tuned. But first let's get back to how this is regulated by that um, bot regulated. And so one of the regulatory things is gonna be NADPH because it turns out that one of the things, remember, of the pentose phosphate pathway is it's actually making NADPH. And so if you make a lot of NADPH, well, now we get this negative feedback regulation, which says, okay, we've done enough of this pentose phosphate stuff. 
But even once we make that decision, we still need to decide, okay, well, are we going to go towards glycolysis? Are we going to go towards leukoneogenesis? Um, do we want to upregulate PFK1 or do we want to upregulate FBPAs1? Um, and so PFK1 would basically take us towards glycolysis and FBPAs1 would take us towards gluconeogenesis. And these are going to be allosterically regulated by citrate, ATP, AMP, and ADP. So citrate, that's going to be basically one of the components of the citric acid cycle. So basically, if we were to go through glycolysis downstream of this, we would have citrate. We'd also get that from like fatty acid um, breakdown and stuff. So basically, if we're making enough energy, this is going to feed back and say, okay, PFK1, stop sending stuff down glycolysis. We've got plenty. But what if we don't have we what if we don't have enough energy? we would still want to basically keep doing glycolysis. And so if we basically don't have a lot of ATP, if we have instead a lot of ADP or AMP, these are then going to go and stimulate PFK1 to take us towards glycolysis. And we could also say, okay, well, if we have a lot of AMP, basically we don't have a lot of energy and so we're not going to want to go and we're not going to go to go and make glucose instead of breaking it down. So let's inhibit FBPAs1. So the same molecule AMP can regulate both of these. Another regulator of PFK1 as well as FBPAs1 is going to be this molecule called fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Um, it's another one of those allosteric regulators, and it sounds like it's something that's just like from your gly glycolysis pathway. Well, there we had fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and here we have fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Um, so when you see bis, basically this is saying 2, it's got these two phosphate groups. Um, if you see like diphosphates, like ADP, adenosine diphosphate, that would be the phosphate groups attached to one another in like in a row. But when we see bisphosphate, they're in two different places. And in glycolysis, we get this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and here we're talking about fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Now, both of these are going to be made from fructose 6-phosphate, which was a product of the glycolysis. So this is kind of like a sidetrack from that glycolysis that's going to give us this molecule, F26BP. Now, F26BP is able to allosterically regulate um, both PFK1 and, PF and FBPAs1, but in opposite directions. So when it binds to PFK1, it increases its affinity for fructose 6-phosphate. Um, and when it binds to FBPAs1, it reduces its affinity for its substrate. PFK1 activity in the presence of F26BP is going to be higher, but the, F, um, the FBPAs1 activity in the presence of F26BP is going to be lower. And so, well, what, how do we regulate the making of F26BP? So we said if we have F26BP, we're going to stimulate PFK1 and this is going and inhibit FBPAs1. So this way we don't have this like fetal cycle. We're regulating them at both at the same time. And we're doing so in a way that's going to favor glycolysis. If we don't have F26BP, well, now basically things are going to be the opposite. We're going to be favoring gluconeogenesis. And so we can control the levels of F26BP accordingly. And this is done through hormonal control. So going back to our idea of like insulin and insulin's kind of opposite glucagon. So insulin is going to be released by our pancreas when we have a lot of glucose. It says, let, your, let the glucose in. And then we have our glucagon, which says we don't have enough insulin. We don't have enough sugar. And so, hey, liver. Um, stop eating the sugar and, and give us some um, and start making it. So basically, we want gluconeogenesis in response to glucagon. If we want gluconeogenesis, well, basically what we want to do is we want to have low levels of F26BP. Whereas if we have insulin, lots of insulin, we're going to want high levels of F26BP. And so it turns out that basically what can happen is that the making of this F26BP is done by this and this really cool enzyme that's actually this two parts or it's bifunctional. So it's got a phosphatase domain and a kinase domain in the same protein. It's really cool. So basically it has this kinase domain that's going to take fructose 6-phosphate 
phosphorylate it to give you fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate. And then it has a phosphatase domain, which is going to take fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate and dephosphorylate it to give you fructose 6 phosphate. What determines whether it's acting as a kinase or whether it's acting as a phosphatase is its own phosphorylation state. When it's phosphorylated, basically, you're going to activate the phosphatase domain. This is going to then decrease the levels of F26BP, and this is going to inhibit glycolysis and stimulate gluconeogenesis. Alternatively, if it's not phosphorylated, well, now you're going to have the kinase domain active. You're going to make F26BP, which is going to stimulate glycolysis and inhibit gluconeogenesis. So if we phosphorylate this enzyme, we are basically going to be inhibiting glycolysis and stimulating gluconeogenesis. If we dephosphorylate this enzyme, we're going to stimulate glycolysis and inhibit gluconeogenesis. And so now we need to go back and think about when would we want to do what? Well, in response to glucagon, our signal that there's low blood sugar, we're going to want the liver to basically increase the amount of gluconeogenesis that's going on and stop doing glycolysis. So we would want there to be phosphorylation of this enzyme. Glucagon is going to act through a G-coupled protein-coupled receptor to make cyclic AMP. That cyclic AMP is going to activate the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, which is then going to phosphorylase this protein, inactivate its kinase domain, activate its phosphatase domain, and basically then inhibit glycolysis and stimulate gluconeogenesis. To remove the phosphate, well, here it's going to respond to insulin, so basically the opposite of glucagon. The insulin is going to activate phosphoprotein phosphatase, which is going to remove this phosphate group to stimulate glycolysis and inhibit gluconeogenesis. So long, complicated, all this sorts of regulation, but is a great example of reciprocal regulation being used so that you don't have this like fetal cycle, making and breaking glucose at the same time. And finally, let's talk about this last step. In glycolysis, we take phosphoenolpyruvate and we um, take the phosphate group and off of it and put it onto ADP to give us ATP. Um, this is carried out by pyruvate kinase. Um, in gluconeogenesis, this is the one that happens in those two steps. We have our pyruvate carboxylase step. It's going to give us take us from pyruvate to oxaloacetate. And our PEP carboxykinase step is going to take us from oxaloacetate to phosphoenolpyruvate. So that glycolytic enzyme, pyruvate kinase, it's going to be allosterically inhibited by ATP. Um, as well as in our liver, where we'll see that it's actually going to be regulated by phosphorylation as well. So we have different versions of this pyruvate kinase. We have in our liver, we've got this L form. And then like in our muscles, we have this M form. Both of those are going to be regulated um, by ATP. But then also in our liver, we're going to get this phosphorylation regulation, which we'll get to in a second. Why does it make sense to be regulated by ATP? Well, basically, if you take pyruvate, you can go different directions. You can go and you can take it through the citric acid cycle and you can generate energy. You can make ATP. Or you could go and you could take it to oxaloacetate. You can go to gluconeogenesis and make glucose. Now, if you're making, if you have a lot of ATP, basically the way you're going to get ATP is if you were to take it through to the citric acid cycle and then to oxidative phosphorylation that way. And if you have a lot of ATP building up that way, well, maybe it's time to go a different way. And so the ATP is going to negatively regulate this, um, this pyruvate kinase. In addition to be regulating by ATP, it's also regulated by other downstream things. So it can be regulated by acetyl-CoA, by alanine, which can be made from pyruvate, um, by long-chain fatty acids, basically a lot of different signals that we have enough energy. And so let's go and let's do other things like make glucose. It also gets positively regulated though. Um, and so one of the things that actually regulates it is F16BP. So we just talked about how F26BP could be used to regulate things. Well, F16BP, that was actually one of the products of the of glycolysis. So basically, up here, we have this F16BP being made, 
And it's going to be activating this kinase at the very end of the pathway. Why does this make sense? Well, remember that this was our committed step. And so if we're saying, okay, we're pumping a bunch of stuff into this pathway, get ready for it. And so it's going to say, okay, get ready, pyruvate kinase, get active because we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of stuff coming your way. And so that's why you get this kind of positive feedback from earlier on in the pathway, as well as the negative feedback from later on in the pathway. And then in our liver, things are going to be a little more complicated. We still have that same regulation, but now we're going to have it actually an extra layer. Because in our liver, remember here, we can actually go and we can go glucone, we can do gluconeogenesis. And so in our liver, basically, it's going to respond to glucagon. So it's going to respond to that hormone that says that we have low blood sugar. And our other cells, they're not going to have that glu the glucagon receptors and stuff, but our liver is. And that glucagon receptor is going to act as a GP, one of those GPCRs. It's going to go through and, like we talked about before, give us the pathway where basically we can make cyclic AMP. And that's going to activate our PKA, our protein kinase A. That's going to phosphorylate pyruvate kinase, the liver form. Now, this, this when it's phosphorylated, it's inactivated. So we see a lot of instances in which phosphorylation activates something. In this case, it deactivates something. So it deactivates pyruvate kinase. If you're deactivating pyruvate kinase, well, here, this is going to prevent things from going, the pyruvate from going into glycolysis and instead be, let it be used to go the other way and make, um, make glucose from it. And so that's how we can regulate the pyruvate kinase. How do we regulate the other things? So we have our pyruvate carboxylase and our PEP carboxykinase. Um, basically, pyruvate carboxylase, um, so that, that one that was taking pyruvate to oxaloacetate, it turns out that it is going to be allosterically um, it's going to be allosterically activated by acetyl-CoA. So remember, acetyl-CoA was going to be inhibiting the pyruvate kinase. And so it was inhibiting the upstream path of this from glycolysis. It's also actually going to be inhibiting the, the step from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA so that things are kind of like, if you do get to pyruvate, don't go forward into glycolysis if you already have a bunch of acetyl-CoA. But if you have a bunch of acetyl-CoA, okay, now let's stimulate it going the other direction. Let's stimulate that pyruvate carboxylase to get us oxaloacetate. In terms of, though, we still have that next step where we have to go from oxaloacetate to, and we have to go from oxaloacetate to our phosphoenol pyruvate. We need that PEP carboxykinase. And it turns out that it's mostly going to be regulated transcriptionally. So our insulin, it didn't just activate that one kinase and stuff. It actually goes and it goes through pathways that are going to activate transcription factors. So it's going to activate proteins that are going to regulate the expression of genes. And it's going to regulate the expression of a bunch of different, of a bunch of different enzymes, including decreasing the expression of PEP carboxykinase. So it's basically insulin is then able to turn off the things that you need for gluconeogenesis and turn on things that you need for glycolysis. And then we have other transcript, other hormones, other transcriptional regulators that can stimulate th making things for gluconeogenesis. So there's all sorts of transcriptional regulation that goes on there. Now let's go and identify various examples of these regulatory strategies and at play in these pathways. Well, the one with the most complicated regulation is going to be this step that's that committed step of glycolysis. This makes sense because we want to regulate tightly the entry into a pathway that is going to be basically once we go in that pathway, the other alternatives are gonna be a lot harder to go to. And so this is why we tightly regulate this phosphofructokinase and fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase 1. We can regulate this both by responding to the, with negative feedback to downstream products, so like responding to make our supply match our demand, and responding to our demands, increasing our supply if we need to. So basically, if we're running low on our products, make more. 
if we're running low on our reactants, but with a lot of products, well then let's start, let's, let's make less and let's instead use these things for other pathways. We can have these same molecules therefore be negatively regulating one pathway and positively regulating another pathway. An example of reciprocal regulation as well as signal as integration between these different pathways. We also saw how we had examples of hormone-based regulation in this step where we had glucagon and insulin be controlling the making of a metabolic modulator, this F26BP, this allosteric modulator. We could have these hormones basically acting through phosphorylation relays, binding, um, affecting these multifunctional enzymes that have these complicated effects that make this allosteric product, which then has opposing effects on opposing enzymes because we want to reciprocally regulate these enzymes so that we don't have a fetal cycle, where basically we're making and breaking at the same time, and all that it's doing is generating heat, not any beneficial energy or anything like that. So all of those were examples of, of regulatory strategies. We also talked about how we can basically have compartmentalization where and specialization where certain cells would have receptors so that our liver had receptors for glucagon and it had those enzymes that were specialized for responding to the metabolic needs and, um, and responding to basically the functions of the liver, its requirements to supply glucose to the rest of the body. We saw how it had basically this different hexokinase, this glucokinase with a low, with a higher KM, so that it's basically going to still allow glucose to get out and not hog it all. And it's able to respond to changes in glucose concentrations. In our other tissues, we had this lower KM, a tighter affinity, so that it was basically, although those cells were seeing less glucose, they were able to trap it more efficiently. We also saw how we could have other pathways relay this kind of like similar information so that even if we don't have energy being formed from glycolysis, if we have a lot of ATP building up from other pathways, as well as things like um, acetyl-CoA building up from other pathways, that can also be a signal that we have plenty of energy and therefore we can go a different pathway. So integration of signals from both inside of the cell, from outside of the cell, through hormones, different specialization in different tissues, allosteric regulation to the max, all of these things are dis on display in these pathways. And then all of these things are also in display in a lot of other pathways that we're not going to have time to get into, but hopefully you can apply the same logic and those pathways will seem more, I guess, logical. Finally, just I, as I promised, I want to tell you that cool medical story about the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, so basically, when we have the pentose phosphate pathway, that's when we want to make NADPH, we want to make DNA, RNA, fatty acids, steroids, all those good things that we can make um, from glucose instead of just like breaking it down. The cells and tissues that are going to use it, um, these include like rapidly dividing cells so that they can make RNA and DNA so that they can duplicate their DNA in order to divide and still have enough DNA for each cell. Cells, tissues that are doing a bunch of fatty acid synthesis, um, that fatty acid synthesis is going to need that NADPH. Um, so remember, we talked about how NADPH is going to be used typically for anabolism. So if we're making things, well, we're going to have to regenerate that. And one of the ways that we can regenerate that is through the pentose phosphate pathway. Another reason why you would want to use the pentose phosphate pathway um, is if you're making cholesterol and steroid hormones, which are also going to need that NAD, um, also going to need that NADPH. And remember that NADPH was kind of going to be what was the control relative concentrations of that were kind of helping control whether things were, whether glucose six phosphate was entering glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway. And so if you already had a bunch of NADPH, then you don't need to go to the pentose phosphate pathway, at least for that sense. Um, so that would inhibit this and, and stimulate glycolysis instead. But that's not all that you need the pentose phosphate pathway for. Um, but the NADPH really is important. And one of the things that it's important for is actually regenerating glutathione. So glutathione is one of our body's main antioxidants that basically it's able to take the hit from reactive oxygen species to oxidize 
Um, so you go from these two glutathione molecules to oxidized glutathione, where you form this disulfide crosslink between them. In order to regenerate glutathione so it can be used as an antioxidant again, you need to reduce it. And it's reduced by NADPH. And this NADPH is made by, the, um, by this pentose phosphate pathway. And so what's the medical connection? Well, it turns out that this G6PD, is this glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, is one of these enzymes in the pentose phosphate pathway. So it's this first enzyme in the pentose phosphate pathway, and it makes NADPH from NADP+. And it turns out that some people have a deficiency of this. So you might have heard those commercials like, ask for a doctor if you have a G6PD deficiency. Well, the problem with having a G6PD deficiency is now you can't keep up with oxidative stress sometimes. And this is especially um, potentially an issue in the case where you're taking like anti-malarial drugs or other drugs that lead to an increase in reactive oxygen species. So that reactive oxygen species can kill the malaria parasite, but it can also overwhelm the red blood cells of patients with this deficiency, um, causing those cells to degrade and leaving the patients without enough red blood cells. Um, so this is called like hemolytic anemia. There's also other chemicals that can trigger this as well as like including ones that are found in fava beans. So people with this deficiency should avoid such drugs and triggers, but many people don't even know that they have the condition because it's not routinely screened for. Um, but that is your G6PD connection, which again was that enzyme, the first enzyme in the pentose phosphate pathway, which was an alternative fate for glucose. So remember, metabolism is messy, but there is a logic to it. And if we focus on this logic, then we can understand all sorts of different metabolic quote unquote pathways, which are really more like this giant web. So focus on the logic of metabolic pathways, the chemical logic. Why do we ship things around? Why do we phosphorylate here? Do we want to make a better leaving group? Do we want to set things up for a cleavage? What about the thermodynamic logic? How can we set up pathways so that we can use energetically favorable reactions to drive unfavorable ones? How can we couple things together? How can we control the levels of the concentrations of things, keep things in a steady state at which we're able to continuously have a drive but have steady levels of things? How can we maintain some reactions near equilibrium so we can easily reverse them, but other ones far from equilibrium so we can use them to control directionality based on controlling the activity of the enzymes? Can we, we can control the activity of the enzymes on different time scales, controlling where, when um, these enzymes are actually made on a longer time scale, or quickly regulating them based on like phosphorylation, sometimes in response to a signaling cascade, based on allosteric regulation, sometimes by the things that um, upstream in the pathway to like um, so that you get ready down the line, sometimes from in negative and feed back from things further down in the pathway so that if you're making enough of something, you don't keep making it. And we could also kind of free up enzymes from sequestration, take them say out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm, all sorts of different examples of how we can regulate these pathways by regulating the activity of the enzymes as well as the concentrations and all that good stuff. So metabolism is complex. It's intertwined. Um, we've looked at these pathways in kind of like isolation, but really it's all connected.